you need to line things up exactly in Affinity Designer, you have a lot of options. Snapping, grids, guides. We're gonna look at all of them in this video. So let's jump in. What's up guys, it's Trent, and today we're talking about all the tools in Affinity Designer that let you precisely line up your objects. So let's start with the thing that you can activate with one button press, the snapping tool. The snapping tool is this icon right here. It looks like a magnet, and some people also call it magnetics. But what happens is when I turn it on, if I have my objects and I move them around, you'll see that they'll automatically line up with logical parts of my composition here. And you can see this square is lining up with the other square. So there'll be different colored lines depending on how things are lining up. So for example, right now you can see up and down, there's a green line saying it's aligning that way. If you align on the horizon, you get a red line there. And of course you can align them both ways at the same time and you'll see lines going both ways. One other color indicator you'll see is when you put nodes on top of each other. So if I drag this node over here on top of the other one, you see it turns yellow. There are a couple of other colors that show up for more obscure situations, but those are the basic hints you get on the UI about how things are aligning. Now, one thing I'll say right up front about the snapping tool is for me, it's the kind of thing you'll turn on and off as you work on something. I don't usually have it on all the time, but there are ways you can kind of temporarily disable it to make your life a little easier. So for example, I have these two squares again, and right now snapping is on. So if I move them, it will be snapped. However, if you press the Alt button when you're moving, it will temporarily disable snapping as you move your object around. If I let go of Alt, snapping comes back. Now just remember, you have to press Alt after you start moving your object to disable snapping. If you press Alt and then move your object, you'll make a copy of it, which probably isn't what you wanna do in this situation. Just remember, you have to hold Alt after you start moving your object. Another way you can control snapping on a finer level is to exclude an object from snapping. So the way you do that is right click on the object in the layer panel and say exclude from snapping. Now it's important to understand what this means. This green object has been excluded from snapping. It will still snap to other things. You can see it's snapping to these squares. However, other things will not snap to it. So this, this uh, triangle here it won't snap to the green. It's snapping to the blue. That's why you see it there, but actually the green it's not, it's not snapping to. And this is useful if you have some object that's kind of distracting you and things keep snapping to it. So it's just another way of adding more fine grain control to the snapping options. And of course to undo it, you can just right click on the object in the layer panel and put it back and things will snap to it again. Now, what if you want even more fine grain control? Well, that's where this drop down here comes into play. Right next to magnetics, you click on it and you get all these options. Now, I won't bore you with detailed descriptions of all of them, but I'll give you some of the highlights here, the ones that I use. First of all, something that's really cool is you can actually create a preset. And if you're doing this for the first time, this preset is probably empty. I just clicked create preset and then I created one for the default options. That way I can always go back to it. So these are the default settings here, but there's other settings that they pre-made for you just kind of for interesting use cases like page layouts. If you wanna do like UI design, you can select this one. It selects the pixel perfect alignment here, but the presets are a useful tool if you have certain configurations you wanna use over and over again. Now here we have the candidates list and candidates just means what objects can you possibly snap to. So by default, it's immediate layers and children. This is usually pretty much everything almost. I mean, you could do all layers just to get everything there. Immediate layers isn't gonna include child layers. So it's just gonna include everything that's a sibling of your current object that selected and parents. And then candidate list is going to select the last X number of things you worked with. So if I put it to like something like two, it's only gonna snap to the last two objects that I worked with. So to give you an idea of how that works, I've set candidate list to two here. So what will happen is if I select these objects, the green is only gonna possibly snap to the pink and the blue. So if I move it around, it snaps to the pink and the blue, but it's not gonna snap to the yellow yet. If I click, let's see, yellow, green, pink, it's only gonna to snap to the green and the yellow. So it snaps to green, snaps to yellow, but doesn't snap to the blue. So again, this can be really useful if you have tons of objects and you know you only really wanna to snap to the last one you clicked on. It's kind of useful, so I've used it a couple times. Only snap to visible objects is mostly self-explanatory. By default, it's selected. You can turn it off and even if an object is invisible, for example, this rectangle there, if I move my green, it'll snap to this invisible rectangle. 
which is kind of hard to see, but somewhere around there. So yeah, you can see it's snapping. Now force pixel alignment will force your objects to be on the pixel level. So let me create a new document and let's make it something really ridiculously small, like four by four pixels. Now you can see things are just basically snapping to the pixel area. It's a four by four grid. So you can see how stuff is just snapping only to that pixel level. I can't really move it in between. Now, if I hold Alt again, kind of a call back to the old tip, I can actually move it to different places, but by default, snapping is just going to go at a whole pixel level. The grids and guides are something we'll talk about a little bit later in more detail in this video. The baseline grid is something that I believe only really exists in Affinity Publisher. It's a way of lining up text across different pages, so you kind of have these lines. So it's not really too relevant for Affinity Designer. The spread is a really important one. This is essentially the boundaries of your objects. When we say spread, what we mean is these edges here. That's why that's working. So if I turned off snap to spread, you would see it doesn't really align with the edge of the document anymore. And then the rest of the objects are really just kind of how specific you want to be when objects are snapping to each other, whether the bounding boxes, you know, key points in geometry, just things like that. So you can kind of toggle these as you see fit. All right, so, so far we've talked about objects snapping to each other and snapping to special parts of the canvas, but what if we wanna make our own lines to snap to? Well, that's where guides and rulers come into play. So the first thing we should do is show rulers. So you do that with view and go down here to show rulers. And what the ruler is, is these measurements up here. This is going to be the units of your document. So right now my document is in inches. If I change it to pixels, it's gonna be some high number. Yeah, this is pixels now. I'll just put it back to inches to make it simple. Now the top left corner is zero, zero. If for some reason you want to reorient the origin, what you can do is you can click in the corner over here and you can drag and recenter where your document is going to be. And as you move around, snapping is enabled. So here it snapped to the center. So if you want your origin to be in the center of the document, I could let go and it could be there. But I'm just going to actually keep it as the default with the center at the top left corner. Now the real power of rulers comes from guides. And to make a guide, you just click on the ruler and drag onto your canvas. Now what's the point of this? Well, our objects will automatically snap to it. So I have this heart, it's automatically snapping to that guide. If I move my star, it's also snapping to that guide. So I can also make guides going in the other direction, just click and drag from this side, and you can have another guide there. Now when you want to get rid of your guides, you can just click them and drag them off the canvas. And sometimes if your document is a little convoluted, it might be hard to click on your guide exactly. You can also grab the guide from the ruler up here. So just click and drag it off, and over here, click, drag it off. Now another thing you can do if you're always clicking and accidentally moving your guide is you can lock the guides. So right now I can move it, if I go to view, and I say lock guides. Now I can't move my guide anymore, so it's locked and I don't have to worry about it. And of course it still works. And if I wanna move the guide again, I just go to view and uncheck lock guides, and I can get rid of it or move it, whatever I wanna do. Now when placing guides, you don't have to worry about being super precise because there's a tool that lets you set the exact number of the guide, and that is through view guides. Now you'll see in this menu here, it's showing a list of the guides that exist in my document. So this one here shows where it is. You can actually double click on it and just type in exactly where you want it to be. So if I want it to be at six, I can move it there. If I want to add a vertical guide exactly, let's say at, I don't know, three, it can go there. And like all fields in Affinity Designer that have numbers, you can do math equations with this. So if it's like eight divided by four, that would be two. Now eight divided by four isn't that hard of math, but sometimes when you're dealing with large pixel numbers, that can be a handy little feature to just type in the little equation there and it'll do the math for you. And you can also click on this button here to toggle it as percentages. So right now, in my document, six inches is 75% down here. If I want to be 25%, it's up here now. Maybe I want my vertical guide to be exactly in the middle. So I can say 50%. Now it's centered there. So this is a pretty handy feature to precisely align your guides exactly where you want them to be. Now we also have this concept of column guides and that is this option over here. Now by default, they're not turned on. So you have to go view, show column guides and you're still not gonna see anything because it's one by one. To see column guides, you actually have to make this something that's not one. So let's increase this. And now you can pretty clearly see what's happening there. It's creating these columns and I can do more rows. So let's do that. Let's do another column. So you can see I have this three by two grid of areas. Now there's two styles you can do for the column guides. You can make them filled like this, or you can make it outlined. 
if you want to see it in that way. You can also change the color. So maybe I want it to be red, stands out a little bit more. Now you can also change the margins here. So let me add some labels so you can see. This is what the margins are referring to. So if I change the top, they're linked right now. Let me unlink them. I'll break the chain. So if I want the top, I can make the top like four inches. That's a little much. Let me make it like one. I can make the gutter bigger. So where's the gutter here? I want it to be 0.5. Maybe I want the left side to be two inches. So you can customize all this stuff. I'll put it back to the default. So what do these guys do to us? Well, they're points that we can snap to. So if I want to fill this with some type of square, I can do that. You can see how this would be very useful for print layouts. One thing I'll do is I'll say frame text. I'll put this here. Now, one trick you can do with this tool is that you can right click and you can say insert filler text. So if I'm doing some type of pamphlet or a document or brochure, I can kind of get an idea of how things will look. These column guides can be a really useful way of laying out your design. Now let's talk about grids, not to be confused with guides, which also start with a G. So grids are basically going to turn our page into graph paper and they're not enabled by default. So you can turn them on by view show grid. And you can see there's these lines here and they're kind of hard to see, but of course, like everything we can customize them. So let's go to the view grid menu, grid and axis. Now, if you want to change the color, that option is down here. So I'll change it to say, let's say red. Now you have the kind of the major one, which is the grid lines and then the subdivisions. So you could change your subdivision color. Actually, you have to unlink it first. And I could make the subdivision maybe blue. And you can change the opacity too. So if you want them to be the same color, you could have one be lighter than the other. And like the other tools, there's this preset option here. So if you change things down here and you want to save it permanently, you can just go to create preset. But the main thing to focus on here is these different modes. Now by default, it's automatic mode. What automatic mode means is that as you zoom in, it's going to dynamically create more lines for you. And by the way, in case it wasn't obvious from what this is called, objects will snap to your grid, but I don't believe it's on by default. Yeah, so you have to turn on snap to grid to make this work. So make sure you do that. And now we'll actually snap to our grid and we can get exact alignment. So basic is pretty similar to automatic, except you're not going to get those new lines as you zoom in. So it's just going to stay the same. So this is useful if you just want to have a fixed grid. By default, it gives you one subdivision, which doesn't give you any lines in between. But if I make it two, you can see I get stuff in between. I can make it 10. And of course I can change the spacing to whatever I want it to be. So something you can also do is click show access editing handles. And that's just going to give you this little widget over here. So you can kind of move your grid as you see fit. So if you want it to be different, you can position it in a different area. This would be kind of useful if you had something existing already in your document and you wanted to align your grid to it, but I'll just recenter it and turn that off for now. Now, one of the cool things about grids is that they work with the pen tool also. So I'll select my pen tool here and notice it snaps to the different intersection points. So this is obviously useful if you want to make very precise shapes. Now, one thing to keep in mind, let me make this a rounded, smooth curve. One thing is that the handles will not snap to the grid by default. If you want to do that, make sure you check this box here, align handle positions using snapping options. So I'll click that. And you can see that actually now it will snap to the grid. So that's just something you have to know to enable. But once you do, it works actually really well. So the advanced layout is where things start to get really interesting because now you can actually do things like isometric layouts. So if you select grid type, I'll select the first one and you can see this is what isometric looks like. It's very useful for like video game art or maps or just a lot of these kind of like top down views of things that don't really have perspective in it. I personally like the two to one isometric option a lot and you can just kind of draw these areas here. Maybe I want to make some green park area. You can draw buildings and things like that. So I'll make this. So there's lots of cool stuff you can do with the advanced one. You can kind of take it as far as you want. So finally we have cube and this is definitely another more advanced one. I think it's useful if you want to build your grid with respect to a unit cube. So for example, maybe someone gave you this block here and this is kind of the model for how you want to build up your, your scene. You know, you could kind of toggle these options and try to fit it to the, the shape there, or perhaps they gave you the exact measurements. But you know, this is a more advanced one, but if you're trying to actually precisely create an exact grid based on a cube, this would be a useful one to use. One thing I want to warn you about when snapping objects together is that you will often get this fine line between them. So for example, I've snapped these two squares together, but you can see there's this thin white line. I mean, it's the color of the background, but that's basically what it is there. And if you actually export the document, it is still there. So let me export this as a PNG and then I'll open it in affinity photo. You can see if I zoom in, there's still this hairline seam there. Now one workaround is to add a little bit of a border. So if I add the border here, 
and I increase the stroke a little bit. You can see it's gone, but you know that's not an option for all designs. There's certainly situations where you can't just go and add a stroke. So it's really just something to be aware of when you're snapping things together. You know, make sure your background is something that either hides this or you're using a stroke, or maybe even you're just overlapping them a little bit. It's a little bit frustrating, but usually it's something you can get around, but just be aware of it. And as always, make sure you double check your output files after you create them for faults like that. So that covers snapping guides and grids in Affinity Designer. It's a good thing to be familiar with, especially if your work requires precision. The default snapping tool is pretty good, but if you need something that packs a little more punch, you can customize it or you can start looking into things like guides and grids. I hope you found this video helpful and let me know in the comments if you have any questions or suggestions for future videos. As always, thanks for watching and see you in the next video.